There is a process when I'm building a guitar called voicing. Some call it tuning, and I bet it's got a bunch of other names too. It's where you tune the braces on your soundboard to a desired frequency, whilst being careful to maintain the structural integrity of the top. And that's all very well, but today I want to explain to you in very basic terms what removing material from a piece of wood does to its sound, and how that translates into sonic characteristics according to the material species. And this video is the product of my desire to do just that. As you'll see throughout the video, I did start with a plan, and by the end that plan was out the window. True to my form, this is not a scientific test, but in the end I did find it really useful and I'm hoping that you will too. Today I'm going to make a tonewood test xylophone. Now first of all, I think it's important to reiterate a few points. If you didn't know, the thing that makes different timbers good for different types of guitars is essentially down to the structural makeup of the genus. Generally denser woods are said to produce a more bright and articulate sound, while less dense woods tend to produce a more warmer and rounded tone. This is because denser woods can resonate more efficiently and faster, leading to a more defined sound. People pick different woods for a number of reasons, musical style, aesthetics, usage. So high density woods, although they're more efficient in their resonating, they're not always the right choice for everybody. Now what do we mean when we talk about density? Essentially all I'm talking about is not the volume, not the mass, rather how tightly the atoms are packed into that piece of wood. Now today I'm going to expect to see some bright, punchy tones on my xylophone because I have picked two woods which are rather dense. So. What are these woods? These woods are Indian rosewood and African paduke. So let's start with the pros of using Indian rosewood on an instrument. One of the main reasons I'm drawn to Indian rosewood is because it's aesthetically really beautiful. It's distinctly purpley red and I really love that colour scheme with the likes of spruce on the top for example, but even with a redwood or something it just goes together with anything you want. Another thing that makes Indian rosewood really popular is the bell-like sustain that it gives on an instrument. Plenty of clarity, it's a really great choice for people who aren't sure what they really want and just maybe want something traditional. It's also very dense so it's got good stability and I'm also going to put on the list that it's really nice to work with because as a luthier that's important. Although that being said the dust gets everywhere and if you are unfortunate enough to have a piece of Indian rosewood which is highly resinous, God be with your belt sander. So that can lead the charge for the cons list on the Indian rosewood. And now of course we come to the biggest con with Indian rosewood which you've probably seen coming, the sustainability problem. Indian rosewood is becoming increasingly more regulated. As a wood it's been heavily exploited in the past and it takes about 50 years for an Indian rosewood tree to mature. Subsequently it's often taken from natural habitats as opposed to plantations. The birds and the badgers are being left without a home, that really gets me in the heartstrings, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So let's move on to African Paduke. I love this timber, but that's not important, Daisy. <laughs> Not about me. Paduke's known for being a really characteristically coloured timber. It's bright red, bright orange, it's just gorgeous. You can get some purpley bits in there sometimes. Oh, heaven. It's also known for its sound, it's very like a rosewood, but it is very good on the articulation. Actually, I read somewhere that Paduke is ideal for xylophones, so... I'm expecting big things. Perhaps one of the biggest pros to using Paduke over rosewood is that it is quite sustainable in comparison. Uh, trees are often grown in plantation-based environments where they're responsibly managed and it takes only about 15 years for a Paduke tree to mature, which makes it a much better choice moving forward. Anyway, this is a a fair test video, so I'm going to talk about some of the cons. Any import of exotic hardwood is going to come with a price tag of environmental problems. Shipping it from one place to another across the globe is not super great. Also, if you keep your Paduke guitar outside of the case, it generally will fall subject to sun exposure, which mutes those beautiful red colours slightly over time. Okay, admin done. Let's crack on with making the xylophone. I'm using these pen blanks I found online because they're actually too small to make into keys individually, but when you put them together, they're the perfect size. So I'm gonna plane them all to dimension and then glue them up so I just have a bit more width to play with. Also, technically guitar tops are jointed, right? So this is just another layer of science that I'm giving you. Gluing, let's talk a bit about the rails that our xylophone keys are gonna sit on. I thought I'd use some cedar because cedar is a really popular choice for a guitar top. Cedar is light and stiff so I was making some go bars from it the other day and I have perfect lengths of cedar that will do the job just beautifully.
Now, I've never made a xylophone before, so I'm looking at this with a bit of suspicion at this point because the keys look remarkably short at the top end. To be fair, I never expected to find concert-length marimba keys in my workshop, so pen blanks had to do at the time, but they are rather short. I am wondering whether they're actually going to have the space to resonate properly for me to take an accurate reading of their note. But now they're all cut to shape, why don't we take it for a spin and see how they're sounding? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay, we need to get tuning, don't we? I'm gonna use my spindle sander for this because the way you tune a xylophone is perfect for a spindle sander. The way you do it is to remove material from the underside of the key, and by doing so, you can lower the pitch of the note. By contrast, if I'd like to higher the pitch of the note, I'll just shorten the length of the key slightly and I'll expect to see that pitch raise. The way I've decided to mount the keys to the rails, by the way, is just to drill an oversized hole in either end of the key and then drill a four mil dowel into the railing so I can just sit the key on top and they can move around freely. And I also found this felt that's supposed to be on the underside of like chair legs when you don't want it to scrape the floor, which are actually great little xylophone hoverboards. You don't really want the wood on wood contact, you want a little bit of padding. So I'm hoping these will do just fine. I also found these little knob things which make it look a bit neater. At this point, I did realise that I was absolutely right about those top keys just being too short. They really weren't making a good sound at all. They had to come out. So I go back to my wood stash and I have a rummage around and bingo, an opportunity. Now at the start, we were talking about higher density woods versus lower density woods. And from the start of this project, I, I didn't think properly because I should have had lower density woods on that keyboard at the same time as higher density woods. And my up has given me an opportunity to include some lower density woods so that you guys can see how they behave. To cover these bases I dug out some walnut and some sycamore and then I found some super dense African blackwood. The African blackwood is much more dense than the Paduke and rosewood so we're really gathering a spectrum here. Finally something in between the African blackwood and the rosewood and the Paduke is Wenge. So I got these new blanks up to speed and got them settled onto the keyboard in their respective shapes. Here's a real-time example of how much material removed impacts the pitch. Here's before. And now I'm gonna sound a bit off. And here's after. Now the African blackwood, the most dense wood in our roster, was so dense that it was stubbornly sitting at the very lowest note of our scale, despite being half the size of the actual bass note I had planned. Because I'd taken so much length off already trying to make it higher, I had to accept the fate that this key was not going to sit at the end of the register, but it was going to have the lowest note. Right, let's listen to it. <laughs> okay, we start here and then it's all in chronological order, apart from the African blackwood key. Cool. As a pianist, this is quite hard to get my head around because the lowest note is literally in the middle of the keyboard. But let's roll with it. At this stage, I did notice that all of them needed a little bit of a fine tune. So this is where I went in with the hand sanding block. Just like with voicing a guitar, I realized that there came a stage with all these keys that smallest micro adjustment would make a big difference on the pitch. I also drew in the help with my strobe tuner, which I also use when I'm voicing to track the progress of the resonant frequencies. <laughs> This is a highly accurate tuner and I did notice that it could pitch the denser woods within half a second of me striking the key, whereas the walnut and the sycamore, which are our lower density woods, were unable to produce a clean enough note for the strobe tuner to lock onto. Presumably this is because their articulation isn't as good. And the sound that I was expecting them to make, which was, as I said at the start, more mellow, more rounded, was certainly being demonstrated as I struck the keys.
What do you guys think of the sound of each note? Can you even tell the difference? I would say in a blind test I could probably identify those higher paduk notes because they're so distinctive and accurate. I'm actually building an instrument made of paduk at the moment, I can't wait to string it up and see if it's as, as articulate as its xylophone cousin. What I will say is that I think I've learned quite a lot during this video, as random and weird as it was. Leave me a comment about what you think and have a great week, see you soon.